Hello and welcome to Useful Idiots. I'm one of your hosts, Katie Halper. And I am the second host, Aaron Maté. How's it going, Katie? I'm good, you? I'm well. I'm You're well. back? You're back in, in uh, New York City? Yeah, I mean, spiritually, I'm always in a flow state, you know, so mm. who knows where I am spiritually. Right. But, but, but physically, yeah. I'm, physically, I'm right. Too. Yeah. Yeah. It's still my birthday month, so thanks, everyone, for keeping me in your thoughts and prayers. <laughs> I can feel the love. It's a month-long party. It is a month-long party, yeah. I'm going to put someone on blast right now. When I say someone, I'm going to put an org on blast right now. Ready? People I'm will ready. love this because a lot of our viewers hate this organization anyway. Okay. <laughs> I don't know if I'm technically a member anymore. I may have lapsed, but they are a little right-wing for my taste, but I have been historically a member of DSA, Democratic Socialists of America. Mm-hmm. And they had a beach day. And for whatever reason, my only like friends that came to the beach party were friends who had kids. And so I had two friends and their adorable two kids and their partners meet me at the beach. But DSA, which is very ironic because they are a socialist organization and they're about the people. Um, and I assume they care about accessibility, but they had their beach day at this beach called Fort Tilden which is uh, in Rockaway. My friend who was there with her wife and her two kids was like, okay, Katie, we're at Jacob Reese Beach. We're not going to Fort Tilden Beach because we have to walk a mile through tall grass to get to this other beach. So basically what happened is that me and my friends, we didn't join DSA at their beach because it was not very accessible and it was very hard to get to if you have two babies. So I'm kind of calling out DSA for choosing to have a beach day at a place that requires a lot of schlepping. I have to disagree with you, Katie, unfortunately. Really? Tilden, Tilden, if you're looking for a beach in New York City, I mean, I, it is your best option. It's secluded. There's less people. And the DSA kids, they want to have fun. See, to be fair, one of my friends who came, they brought their six-week-old. And wow. I salute them for that. But yeah. at the same time... I don't know. I don't want to like six week old blame. But now that I'm thinking about it, is it on them? I think it's on them. I think we've turned this around. Wow. We were, we, you know, we set out to blame the DSA, but really this is on your friend. For, it is on um, my friend. In fact, I if mean, you're listening and I know you are, this isn't about DSA. You tricked me. You tricked me. Yeah. Anyway, thank you though to the people who came and sorry to, to DSA that we couldn't reach you, but maybe next year. All righty. Should we get to the four basic food groups? Democrats suck. Republicans suck. Isn't that weird? Isn't that terrible? Let's do it. What do we have for Democrats suck? So for Democrats suck, we actually have a surprising Democrats are good moment. Then Democrats come back around and suck. OK, so let's this is at Netroots Nation, which is this conference that I, God help me, used to attend. Uh, it starts it's basically around Daily Coast, the blog Daily Coast. Um, so Marcos Melissas was on a panel with some members of Congress, including Pramila Jayapal and Chewy Garcia and Jan Schakowsky. And this panel was interrupted by protesters saying free, free Palestine and have Palestinian flags. So let's see what happens. I, I, I'll just leave. Maybe I should just walk off. Guys. OK, so first you have Congresswoman Jan Schakowsky responding in a very passive aggressive way. Maybe I'll leave. Maybe I should just walk off because she's offended because she's getting interrupted by these protesters. So then Pramila Jayapal tries to be a bit more diplomatic and let's hear what she has to say. Can I say something? Can I say something as somebody that's been in the streets and, and has participated in a lot of demonstrations? I think I want you to know that we have been fighting to make it clear that Israel is a racist state that the Palestinian people deserve self-determination and autonomy, that the dream, that the dream of a two-state solution is slipping away from us, that it is not, that it does not even feel possible. It does not even feel possible. And I want you to know that while you may, while you may have arguments with, with whether or not some of us on stage are fighting hard enough. I do want you to know that there is an organized opposition on the other side, and it isn't the people that are on this stage. All right, so kind of good. She says some good stuff, like Israel is, is a racist state, but then she also says there's organized opposition that's not from us, trying to pass the buck, basically, to the Republicans. So, yeah, I mean, 
the truth is that sure there she's better than other democrats on this issue but you can't just blame republicans because democrats are pretty awful on this issue too so what happens is she of course not surprisingly walked this back i'm not surprised because this is a woman who walked back a letter asking for diplomacy to be tied to funding and arming the Ukrainian proxy war. She couldn't even stand by that, which was the most milquetoast request. And we've talked about this before. It was just humiliating to watch this happen. There was absolutely, they weren't even asking to, about pausing the arming, pausing the funding. They just wanted, while we're doing that, while we're pa uh, pouring fuel on the fire, could we also at least pretend that we care about diplomacy? So she obviously walked this back. She basically said, it's not a racist state. They're like racist elements in this in this particular government. But that, of course, uh, was not OK. And we had some Democrats get together and write a letter condemning her statements on Israel, saying we are deeply concerned about Representative Pramila Jayapal's unacceptable comments about our historic Democratic ally Israel. And we appreciate her retraction. We will never allow anti-Zionist voices that embolden anti-Semitism to hijack the Democratic Party and country. So that's what they're doing, these leading Democrats. They're basically linking anti-Zionism to anti-Semitism, which, as we've discussed, is a very unfair characterization and, ironically, is actually anti-Semitic in itself because it conflates being Jewish with being pro-Israel, which is something anti-Semites say, and that's why anti-Semites will call Jews Zionists. But Republicans, of course, also uh, showed up, and they um, sponsored a House, uh, a non-binding resolution saying Israel, quote, is not a racist or apartheid state and declared that the U.S., quote, will always be a staunch partner and supporter of Israel. Now, this was a Republican uh, sponsored bill. But what makes this another moment for Democrats suck is that the bill passed with only nine Democrats voting against it. So those nine Democrats were courageous, but all the other Democrats sucked classic democratic thing where someone says something true and factual and they have to walk it back and then everybody everybody else trashes them for saying it but also like it's just so embarrassing to say we will always support this this country i mean i guess it's consistent with israel being the special friend but aren't you supposed to pretend that things are going like aren't you supposed to pretend that things aren't unconditional i guess yeah, not with israel i mean no and, and you know when was the referendum inside the U.S. to say that we are going to just unconditionally support this occupying state. Right. Like, you know, it's it's just this kind of thing that everyone goes along with to the point where even like people like Jamal Bowman, who is a member of the squad and sometimes, sometimes critical of Israel. And he voted he, against this resolution to his credit. He did. But also he tried to justify it by saying something like, yeah, I mean, Israel's our friend. And sometimes with our friend, you have to be honest. Right. But even what, why accept the premise that Israel's our friend? I mean, like, right. is this grade school? <laughs> like, did yeah. we get certain cliques that we all roll with and those we don't? Like, right. it's a country and it happens to be doing really horrible things. So I don't think Democrats right, should have to, a Democrat shouldn't have to apologize for being critical of a government that is, practices a system that's worse than apartheid and is propped up with billions of dollars in, in U.S. aid every year. Right. And they, they, of course, said in this resolution, it's not apartheid, which we know is is false, demonstrably false. Shout out to Rashida Tlaib, who always is great on this issue. And she gave a really moving speech. But you're right that it is a funny concept of like, it's because I like you that I'm criticizing you. As yeah. a friend, I'm going to be honest with you. Yeah. As my apartheid practicing friend, right. I, I like you. I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying I don't, I don't like your like You're just you, kind I of just... acting like an asshole right now. Yeah, exactly. Right. right yeah. 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 Anyway, so that's my Democrats suck. All right. Well, that's going to roll into Republicans suck because Marjorie Taylor Greene, who I have to say is great on Ukraine, <laughs> I, you know, just she's been great on Ukraine as opposed to every single other Democrat in calling for diplomacy and for ending this proxy war. But she's still a Republican and she's still a bigot in so many ways. And here she is going to put that on display in talking about Israel and how, in her view, actually, Israel is unfairly targeted for having an apartheid wall. Walls are very important for for most countries. There's many countries with walls. I, I have one article here that, that comes from uh, earlier this month um, that says 
talking about 65 countries have erected fences on their borders, um, also talking about walls, talking about security fears, widespread refusal to help refugees, <coughs> have fueled a new spate of wall building around the world. Uh, they include Israel's apartheid, apartheid wall, India's 2,500 mile fence around Bangladesh, and Morocco's huge sand berm. So many countries around the world uh, agree that walls are important in, in protecting the people within the country. Uh, How dumb is she? Did she not read that statement before when she read the statement about Israel's apartheid wall? Like, she thinks she's bringing pro-wall. But clearly whoever wrote that is anti that wall and calls it apartheid. Yeah. Well, she realized that after reading it. And uh, it's, pretty funny. it's pretty funny. Yeah. And here's something else that she said recently. She was giving a speech talking about Biden and criticizing him. And unfortunately for, I think, her, a lot of what she said makes Biden look good. And so the Biden campaign capitalized and turned it into an ad. And so this is what the ad said. Joe Biden had the largest public investment in social infrastructure and environmental programs that is actually finishing what FDR started, that LBJ expanded on, and Joe Biden is attempting to complete programs to address education, medical care, urban problems, rural poverty, transportation, Medicare, Medicaid, labor unions, and he still is working on it. Wow. Well done. Honestly, I want to go volunteer for Joe Biden's re-election <laughs> campaign after seeing that ad. Yeah. If only Marjorie Taylor Greene's words were true. Right. You know, it'd make him look great. But I have to say, I think this ad right here is Biden's top accomplishment. Right. It's, the ad in itself. Just the making ad itself that. Right. It's a great ad. And but the ad, of course, are in you know, plays into it's it's so it's such a representative ad of our political spectrum where like both sides have these myths about each other. So right. Marjorie Taylor Greene's eyes, all those things that she says Biden is doing are bad things. And of course, those are actually good things. And if only they were true, if only Biden really had been a president who did all those things and, and did them consistently, but he doesn't. So both right. these sides prop up this fiction about the other and the rest of us are left to suffer. But I have to say credit to the Biden team for taking advantage of that because, yeah, she makes them look really good there. It reminds me of when they call uh, Republicans call them like uh, radical socialists. I'm like, if only, please, yeah, don't sure. get my hopes up. Yeah, sure. Yeah, it does remind me of Rick of of Ron DeSantis, Ron DeSantimonious, uh, taking my words um, along with the words of many other people on the left and making an ad of us saying that he's scarier than uh, Donald Trump. Well, it's a good tactic. It is a good tactic. It's yeah. A good tactic. Yeah, it's well done. I look forward to more. But that one takes the cake. That was. That's right. well done by the Biden team. Well, for isn't that weird? I have a story that I thought we could make this interactive. I'm not going to tell you what this story is, Aaron. I'm just going to show you the videotape. And I want to see if you can try to figure out what is happening here in, in my weird for this week. There are three men and they're chasing something. OK, they they hook the it's a catching pole. OK, so they've they've hooked this little thing. What do you think the thing is? Let's pause it. What do you think the thing is? Is it an animal? It is an animal. Okay. Any idea what kind? And they look like cops. Are they in a uniform? It's two cops and an intern, which okay. is funny because I didn't know cops had intern. Yep. Interns. Yep. Are they walking a dog or? or... Nope. No, it's not a dog. Okay. Uh, I'm stumped. You're stumped. All right. Well, I'll tell you this. It's a raccoon. Okay. Okay. They take, they do something and then the raccoon uh, runs away, almost tripping the uh, the police intern, by the way. His, he was stuck. His, his head was stuck in a mayo jar. So this was a little cute raccoon who was seen running through a Florida neighborhood with an empty mayonnaise jar stuck over its head. And the Plainsville Police Department, two officers along with an intern named Gill, came in and helped this masked bandit with a mayo jar stuck on its head. Okay, so we're actually watching the police help out a raccoon free himself or herself from right. uh, from a mayo jar. Right. Okay. 
It's probably one of the best pro. I mean, I, I didn't realize this, but it's basically propaganda what I'm showing right now. It really is. I didn't realize the cops were that involved in animal stuff, but that's uh, that's very heroic. It is heroic. That. I that's wish they easy. spent more time doing that than sure. and less time interacting with human beings. Yeah. Um, I'd watch a, you know, like remember back in the day there was cops like that show. Oh like, yeah. I'd watch a cops like animal version where they animal just, cops. Yeah. Animal cops. That sounds great. That would be really good. As long Let's as they're nice. Cause they kill a lot of dogs. Do you know that mm. cops kill a lot of dogs? I did not know that. I just undid any propaganda. Good. Politically. I feel better about that, but yeah, they do kill a lot of dogs. So I only, what we could do is we could watch positive animal cops. Yeah, I'm with it. Yeah. All right. Well, for isn't that terrible, we're going to keep on with uh, the world of emergency services and check out what this firefighter recently did. Firefighter sets record for longest and fastest run while set on fire. A firefighter set the record for the longest distance run while on fire and without oxygen. Jonathan Vero ran 893 feet while wearing a protective suit that was set ablaze. It took him just 17 seconds. The task seems like an odd one, but the record for longest distance full body burn run without oxygen has been broken seven times since 2009, according to the Guinness Book of World Records. See, I first thought that this was an accidental break, uh, record breaking. Yeah, no, this uh, apparently we have to have a competition for how long you can run while on fire. The sport, and yeah. Congratulations to the winner. Uh, I'm not sure how how great idea uh, great of an idea that is, but he does say he has always had a passion for fire. He certainly that certainly comes through. That's yeah, very that, very clear. You're right, that comes yeah. through. <laughs> you, you kind of didn't need to tell us that. We saw it. Yeah, I definitely feel his passion. Yeah. All righty, and those are your four basic food groups. We are so excited to be talking to Lev Galinkin. He is a Ukrainian author and journalist. He's the author of A Backpack, A Bear, and Eight Crates of Vodka. Uh, he also writes for places like the LA Times, CNN, the Washington Post, and he focuses a lot on the Ukraine crisis, Russia, the far right, and immigrant and refugee identity. All right, let's go to Lev Galinkin. Lev, welcome back to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Glad to be back. Of course. So we want to start off by asking you about a poll that was released by Vox about Ukraine. Can you share with us what this poll demonstrates? This poll is devastating. And this is not po a poll done by Russia. This is a poll done by Vox. This is a uh, I'm, I'm grateful that they published it because they were uh, this poll did not say things that they wanted them to say. OK, and even in the poll, you could see that the poster was not happy with it. The biggest question of all, when people say Ukraine, OK, it would be like saying America. OK, it would be saying America loves Joe Biden. America is anti-abortion. I mean, whatever it is you want to say, OK, it's it's you're. Whatever it is you say, there are millions and millions and millions of people, half the country, who feel the other way. Okay, With Ukraine, it always gets lost. It's this monolith of Ukraine. Okay, This poll, and I was very surprised by it myself, just shattered things. Because it showed that there is another Ukraine. A Ukraine that's inconvenient to American geopolitics, and a Ukraine that has been ignored and pushed away and written out of the narrative uh in ukraine the eastern ukraine which also happens to bear the brunt of the conflict and this is where i'm from and it's it's these people the half of the country that just has been completely shunted off okay and again bear in mind this is done by vox and it's also done by it's partly sponsored by george one of george torres's organizations okay so this is oh wow it's phrased a little weirdly because with Ukrainian, it's you, there tends to be double negatives used, which is a, which gets a little weird. But let's take a look at this. So, forty-three percent of respondents in, they they interviewed Ukrainians in Ukraine and abroad. Okay, but let's just say forty-three percent of respondents in Ukraine disagreed with the statement that Nazi and Nazi ideology is not widespread. Okay, so they were asked. The statement is Nazi ideology is minimum, is small. Ukraine has very little Nazis. That was what it basically said, okay? And 
43 percent disagreed with that statement. Okay, if you if you get rid of the double negatives, okay. So they're saying that, like, if you get rid of the double negatives, they're saying that the Nazi thing is big. Well, here's a one little thing about this one. Okay, theoretically, and so, uh, Ivan Kachinovsky and Vladimir Ishenko, who are, I trust them very much, uh, and they pointed this out. Theoretically, somebody could kind of say no because they feel there's zero neo-Nazism in Ukraine. Okay. So maybe if they think, you know, the statement is Nazi ideology is not widespread. If I think see. you could disagree with that statement because you think it is widespread or you or technically, I guess you can disagree with it because you think there are zero new right. Nazis. Got it. OK. OK. But that second interpretation is a pretty weird one. You know what I mean? Like you would not say not white. Oh, it's you wouldn't say not widespread. It's it's really mid. But even let's see. Let's see. If half the people said that. Okay, that is still a fifth. One out of every five Ukrainians. Okay, thinks that Nazism is prevalent, is widespread in Ukraine. Okay. Uh, take this poll. This poll shatters everything that we have. We think about this country. Okay. So you're telling me that, that these people, these millions of people, are, are, are all fooled by Russia, are all fooled by uh, watching useful idiots? Okay? That these people are just, I mean, we keep hearing that this is Russian talking points, okay? And here are Ukrainians yeah. happen to say this, okay? That is crazy. You listen to the Atlantic Council, you listen to CNN and MSNBC, okay? And it's like, there are no Nazis in Ukraine. Anybody who even mentions this, it's 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 an insult to Ukrainians. It's an insult. Okay? That's what they say, yeah. Yeah. Meanwhile, you have this poll with Ukrainians actually believe it. Okay? This is insane. Okay? So 29% of respondents in Ukraine disagreed with the statement. This is actually a lot more straightforward than the Nazi question. They okay. The statement is the revolution of dignity, Maidan, the twenty fourteen uprising. Okay, the statement is the up the Maidan revolution was not a coup. It was not a coup. Do you agree that it was not a coup? Twenty nine percent did not agree. Meaning twenty nine percent feel it is a false statement to say there was not a coup. Meaning it is a true statement to say it was a coup. Okay, again, giant Russian talking point. Okay, you say this and it's like, oh, is Putin inside your skin controlling you at this very moment? Okay, the entire narrative goes back to 2013, 2014, where a government was overthrown. And that government happened to be from Eastern Ukraine. Yanukovych, who is a democratically elected president, he was a scumbag, but we certainly have a whole lot of democratically elected scumbags in America as well. So here is the story of, and again, in the newspapers, and then this, there's a film called Winter on Fire. It was a it was an Oscar uh, finalist, okay? And the guy even admitted, he's like, you know, I didn't include I didn't include the people who didn't participate in Maidan because it was, you know, it was just not convenient, okay? Mm -hmm. So the entire Western media wrote, and, and just 22 million people, 22 million people wrote them out of the equation because their opinions were inconvenient. These are also the people who paid with blood, the people who were whose lives were destroyed in the East. So again, a giant talking point, the Atlantic Council will tell you, you are, you're Putin incarnate if you're saying this. And 29%, okay? This, I cannot tell you how important this poll is, okay? So a quarter of you of respondents in Ukraine agree with the statement that it's a proxy war. That <laughs> okay? is so crazy. Okay, twenty uh, a quarter of them under, agreed with the statement that the West is using Ukraine for its own purposes. Um, and here is the last, the crazy one. Okay, we keep hearing about how everybody in Ukraine knows Russia. And the Russians, because this is another bullshit Putin talking point. Thirty-two percent, a third of the country, agreed with the statement that Russian speakers are oppressed in Ukraine. A third of the country agreed with that, with Putin, okay? This poll is earth shattering, okay? And here is why too. Look at these percentages, and these are incredible percentages, okay? But there are three things that are not counted there, 
okay? The three million people in Crimea, okay? Mm. The West, we like to say Crimea is Ukraine. Crimea belongs to Ukraine. But when it comes to Crimeans, the actual people who live in Crimea, we tend to discuss them. Now, Crimeans are the most, you could say, pro-Russian. A Crimean population would be the most to agree with these things, okay? So you're missing three million people out of Crimea. You are missing the people that are in the Russian controlled areas because that poll was not taken there. Okay. Yeah. So you're missing people. You're missing another. I, it, it's so hard to tell these days. Okay. Like, but at least a million. Okay. And you're missing also the people who absolutely have always forgotten the several million who fled to Russia since 2014. Yes. Who, when they fled the fighting, these Ukrainians, and this was my first New York Times op-ed on Ukraine, that it was, you know, I said, how come, if all, if it's Russia versus Ukraine, how come all of these people are, fly, are fleeing to the enemy? If all of Ukraine yeah. is against Russia, why are they going there? Why are they going east? Do they not have their yeah. direction straight? Okay. So first of all, that's what, six million people were there? Okay. And these people are the ones who are the most likely to agree with all of these with all mm-hmm. the, the mm-hmm. most likely to think that Russian speakers are oppressed, the most likely to think that Maidan was a coup, okay? Now, and then there's the fourth factor to think of, okay? The fact that Ukraine has made it dangerous to say these things, mm-hmm. okay? Mm-hmm. That, you know, Zelensky is shutting down churches and arresting people, and everybody is, everybody is a Russian spy, okay? So this is not, this is, this is for real, for real. You know, you do not want to say the wrong thing, okay? So take all of that and then t- take, understand that this is from the people who felt comfortable enough right. to say this. And a whole lot of people did not. Okay. Put all of that together and you start to get a picture of Ukraine. And it's, it's just, it, it's so, it's, it's, this, it's half the country that just disappeared. It's, it's like, imagine like if a Chinese media was talking about, and they said, you know, they're importing from America and they're responding from the U.S. to China, okay? To, to people who don't know anything, they just trust the Chinese media, okay? And they report, everybody in America loves Joe Biden. Everybody in America. And they, and they give an example of giant crowds and be like, look, here are millions of people who love Joe Biden. Trust us, okay? You, you could paint a picture of America that completely ignores half the entire freaking country. And that's exactly what's been done to Ukraine. And what makes it even sicker is this is what's been done to the the people who've been disappeared are the people who are getting killed. And the only time they reappear when they become convenient is when they're killed. Because when they're killed either by Russian and Russian forces or by uh, Ukraine and Ukrainian forces, they neatly join the the ranks of martyred Mm. Ukrainians. Okay. And so this is... in. You know, you look at this poll. There are also millions of Ukrainians who feel the other way, who feel that Russian speakers are not oppressed. You can find millions who feel huh. who feel that Maidan was a popular revolution. Okay, that's that's how a country works, a diverse country works. And this is this is one of the things that just made me lose faith in the American uh, political establishment, American system. Because I mean, you, you know, I, I, I've I've read books by Chomsky. I've read all these other, you know. Um, who was it? Richard Bloom. The um, he died a couple of years. Yeah, Bloom, yeah. Bl- William Bloom. William, yeah. William Bloom. Yeah. L- William Bloom. Yeah. But you know what? And you know, I've taken some classes uh, at college. But it's one thing when you read about it happening, but when you see it, and it's just like and when you have people on the ground who are like, what? Who, who are reading about themselves, and they're like, why is America doing this? You know, you just see an entire country of millions of people just completely, utterly. You know what I mean? Like, imagine watching Chinese TV and hearing that everybody loves Joe Biden or everybody, right. everybody's, everybody's against abortions. Okay? Right. Yeah. And then imagine that China has control over your future. And you're sitting there and you're looking at this and you're just helpless and you're like, oh, my God, these people who have control over our future know nothing about us. It's the classic playbook in every country where the U.S. has an agenda. They will find whatever percentage of the population that exists, even if it's less than half, 
that aligns with U.S. goals. And then the U.S. media will present them as the voice of right. that country every single time. Listen to Ukrainians or yeah, listen yeah, yeah. to Libyans. Or you can, you point out, and when you point out polls such as this, which it's amazing to see, this is after Russia invaded, right? Yeah. And already- yeah. No, this is I recent. Mean, this is recent. So uh, where you'd think that, you know, there would be the, the percentage of people who reject any kind of uh, Russian grievance or Russian aligned claim would be a lot higher, but still it shows how divided this country is. And accordingly, why there are people like U.S. diplomats who are now ignored or people like Stephen F. Cohen, the late Stephen F. Cohen, who constantly warned that trying to force this really divided country into one camp, especially when it's on the border of a nuclear armed power that has long historical ties to this country is just crazy. But that's been the policy we're all supposed to adopt. And we're supposed to ignore all these people in Ukraine who feel otherwise. And same same with NATO, too. You know, there was a poll by Gallup in March 2014, which said that a majority of Ukrainians saw NATO as a threat. Yeah. And even after Russia invaded, there were U.S.-backed polls, which found that support for Ukraine joining NATO was at about 59%. Which means you, which means you still have a lot of people who don't want to join NATO. And again, the similar, uh, the similar thing. Ukraine, out, I bet you they didn't pull them. They, they did not pull Crimea. Exactly. Right there, there. Yeah. Almost a hundred percent of them would would talk about. Okay, so I'm sorry. Continue. Yeah. And, and meanwhile, also there was another poll which found that more people preferred a non-aligned status than to even joining any military alliance. So actually, when they're given a choice, a majority, even after Russia invaded, would still take a non-aligned status. But we're again, as you pointed out. We're not allowed to hear that because those are the inconvenient Ukrainians that don't align with the U.S. agenda. Exactly. And it's, you know, Putin once famously said, or he was rumored to have said, Ukraine is, you know, to toward George H.W. Bush, Ukraine is not a country or um, I'm forgetting the exact words of it. OK. And then and then people in the, people in the think tanks are constantly saying, you know, oh, you're trying to erase Ukraine. And it's like, no. Here's the deal. Ukraine is very much a country and it is very diverse. And the way that it stays that way is it should be diverse because that's what it is. It's at the crossroads of Europe. OK, it's at the crossroads of, of uh, Catholicism and Orthodox faith. It's at the crossroads of Asia and Europe. It, it, it has such a rich heritage. And just as it would be wrong, just, as the, you know, the Soviet Union and the, the Russian Empire before that has oppressed Ukrainians. They have passed enormous amounts of laws oppressing them, oppress, suppressing their language, their culture. They committed genocide against them, I believe, okay, in, in, in the hunger. You, you can acknowledge all of that, but at the same time, you can also say, you know what, there's a second part of the country for which the heroes of Western Ukraine are, are demons. And... Uh, and who speak a different language. and But these people are just utterly ignored. And the last thing I was going to say about this poll is this is phenomenal. If you look at the commentary of this poll, the people, the Vox people who wrote the poll, the conducted survey revealed the overall ability of Ukrainians to differentiate narratives of Russian propaganda. So the Ukrainians that believe the wrong things, they were oh, their right. problem is not that they believe these things. Their problem is that they're they uh, troglodytes. Yeah, they're troglodytes, okay? Right. Just like, you know, the people, who, the, the people who didn't vote for Hillary Clinton, okay, uh, didn't do this because they actually felt this, but did it because they were brainwashed by Russia, okay? So, Aaron, as you love to point out, the, you know, the, the memes that have been doing this, these pernicious memes, obviously, you know, um, so they're better at identifying a language with pro-Ukrainian claims. Pro-Ukrainian claims, their claims are also Ukrainian claims. They're Ukrainians, right. Okay. You know, um, narratives about Nazism and the state coup, which are already rooted in the Ukrainian information space. By the way, Ukrainian information space, Zelensky banned all opposition media. So the Ukrainian, uh, the Ukrainian uh, information space is Ukrainian propaganda. Right. The pro-government propaganda. So that's so. If anything, that, that is not what they should be blaming here. Okay. It is likely that active communication from the government, civil organizations played a role of, uh, regarding hostile disinformation, played a role in this case of new disinformation attempts, blah, 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 blah. Okay? So this is, look at this incredible, incredible, just look at the arrogance, yeah. at the peasants yeah. oozing from it, okay? From this, this journalistic poll, oozing from it. 
Okay. It's just, it's incredible. Okay. But which is kind of like I give them credit for publishing it. Yeah. Despite the, yeah. right. They just had to manipulate yeah. it into, into proof of brainwashing as opposed to proof of a divergent yeah. opinion. Yeah. And it's and the, the, the sickening part about this is this whole thing is done in the name, especially of these Eastern Ukrainians. Okay. You know, we, we will write them out of the picture, you know, in the cause of freedom, in the name of freedom. It's incredible just how this entire, I mean, it's this entire half of the country is just completely, completely shut out of it. And all in the name of, of freedom and Western democracy. I wonder if that's going to get picked up, that poll. Of course it will not. You know, Lev, that attitude you're talking about, that contempt for ordinary people, it's amazing how, as you say, it also was on vivid display with Russiagate. And I want to just I want to read people one example because it's just interesting to see the parallel and how and how it ties into like the contempt for ordinary people in the U.S. not only matches the contempt for ordinary people in Ukraine, but it helps explain the mess we're in because by ignoring ordinary people's voices and blaming everything on Russia and coming up with theories that everybody's duped by Russian propaganda avoids look uh, helps us avoid looking at reality. So, for example, this is from the New Yorker a few years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, during the Russiagate mania. Uh, and this is by this guy named Evan Osnos. He's a writer for The New Yorker. He writes this, at the heart of the Russian fraud is an essential embarrassing insight into American life. Large numbers of Americans are ill-equipped to assess the credibility of the things they read. And what he's trying to say there is that all these Americans who voted for Trump or who were not sufficiently concerned about Russian interference are illiterate and dupes. And that is the elite paternalism condescension that underlines that underlies Russiagate and also is a big part of this Ukraine proxy war too. So I just wanted to point out that this that this condescending attitude, it's 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 and it's um, coming out of the Democratic illegal. Party. And yes, it's coming it is. out of the Democratic Party. Okay. Yeah. The party that's supposed to be of the people, the contempt that they have for these peasants is just yeah. it's I mean, I mean, Marie Antoinette would cringe at that. It's, it's <laughs> so we, Aaron, that last point you made about the Ukraine proxy war, you mean the contempt people have for people who don't support it, that they don't understand I what's mean, at, this, at, uh, this, at stake? I mean, this belief among liberal elites who write for the New Yorker or who are, you know, major Democratic party politicians like Hillary Clinton, that everything can be explained by Russia fooling people, do people, whether it's Russia has fooled all these Ukrainians into believing that actually there are Nazis inside of Ukraine or that Ukraine's being used for a proxy war uh, or that the Russian language is under threat inside right. Ukraine or all these people in the U.S. have been duped into believing that they shouldn't vote for Hillary Clinton. It's elite contempt is and, behind you know, all of this, and it helps explain how we're in the mess we're in. Do you know what? I have an article that has never been published, and I have tried everywhere, everywhere I could, okay? And it points out the racist history behind using this, especially because they were talking about black people in Michigan and Wisconsin who dared to not vote for Hillary Clinton. And the long, 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 I start out with the New York Times article, uh, you know, uh, Germany dupes Negroes. That's mm. the art, this disgusting thing. Okay. What year is that from? 1911, I think. Something mm. like that. It's mm. it's from. Okay, it's basically because because black people, uh, you know, didn't feel the need to join the U.S. Army to fight Germany. Okay, in just World like, War, in World War One. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's and it's German controls. Uh, I mean, it's it's insane, and the exact same thing. Is that like you know? So you have you you know you have a black person in Michigan, and you know what? Um, somehow they aren't concerned about uh, a far right candidate like Trump. Somehow they're just not concerned, and they're just not paying attention. And then ads of buff Bernie Sanders yeah. hit their Facebook page, and these silly black people are duped. Okay, I mean it's it's so behind it is not just contempt; it's racism too. Okay, it's racism. 
and it's contempt for poor people. It's just, you know, it's it's so much easier to just have them be idiots than right. actually deal with the notion that maybe people don't think the way that you do or do not feel the same way that you do. I'm going to be, uh, I think it's going to be a lot. We're going to be seeing that a lot with Cornell West. There's yeah. a very, very long history of tying uh, and I mean, Martin Luther King, the reason why the FBI, the the, the excuse that they used to uh, wiretap him was that he was a Kremlin proxy. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So, you know, there is a very, very, you know, Paul Robeson, uh, well, right. you know, a lot of people, you know, it's going to be... I have a feeling we're going to see that against Dr. West. Well, quite. yeah. And also we're seeing that with the Uhuru, uh, the African People's Socialist Party, who have been indicted as being Russian assets, Russian agents. Yeah, it's just and and somehow you don't see, uh, you know, you don't see a lot of people standing up for them and a lot yeah. of you don't see you don't hear that. But it's, it's a long and really sick history. Um, the Washington Post, I think one point, Jennifer Rubin in the Washington Post. Oh, yeah. Okay. Whose blog post is called Right Turn because she exactly. used to be a total right wing, like to the right of Fox. But yeah, exactly. She quotes somebody like a former FBI person that's saying that the Russians have been messing with us since Dr. King. OK. And wow. I remember emailing the, the people in charge of the Washington Post, which is just I, you're not really supposed to do that. That's, but yeah. I was just like, are you telling me that J. Edgar Hoover was right? Yeah, exactly. Persecuting Martin Luther King, and when they would try to get him to kill himself, right? You're te- you're te- you're telling me like, and this was what like five years ago, or something like that. You're telling me that this this vile filth is still being published. I mean, it's just it's so crazy. What are your thoughts on the recent? I mean, shifting gears a little bit, but I want to know your thoughts on the recent NATO summit and what that revealed about uh, the state of the war and also the Western attitude towards Ukraine. Well, Aaron, you've tweeted this out, or I think I sent this to you. Uh, there was just an incredible New York Times article about uh, sources in the in the about, about sort of basically sources in the U.S. foreign establishment are uh, angry at Ukraine for not pushing hard enough. In other words, you know they're not they're not killing their soldiers hard enough. You know, which is really Russians. Them. Oh, right, yeah. killing their own soldiers hard enough, or right, yeah, got it. Yeah, they're not. Let's pushing. read the let's read the quote. Let's yeah, read the quote. It's so an amazing, good. it's unbelievable that it says it all about this proxy. It's kind of a museum of these things. It's just- yeah. Senior U.S. officials in recent weeks have privately expressed frustration that some Ukrainian commanders exasperated at the slow pace of the initial assault and fearing increased casualties mm-hmm. among their ranks had reverted to old habits, <laughs> decades, <laughs> old decades habits. of Soviet-style training in artillery barrages rather than sticking with the Western tactics and pressing harder to breach the Russian defenses. So in short, U.S. officials are frustrated that Ukrainian commanders aren't sacrificing their own people out of fear of increased casualties. And when you're fighting a proxy war on our behalf, how dare you worry about casualties among your ranks? That's the message that I'm getting from this. And also note the same to bring in the previous theme, note that they're just they're doing this you know why they're doing it because the idiots are relapsing back to their soviet <laughs> style of thinking yes <laughs> the yes. troglodytes are regressing okay <laughs> how many times does the atlantic council have to enlighten these motherfuckers okay yeah. and and also by the way whoever wrote the, you know whoever thinks of it or whoever said it okay yeah, you want to know what the Soviet Union was known for? You want to know what the uh, Stalin was known for? I'll tell you, he was not known for conserving uh, people. Okay, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. The weird thing about it. They would. They, so everything about this quote is just amazing. Okay, because <laughs> let me tell you, the Soviet style of fighting is to send cannon fodder, fodder, and send more and more and more and more. That was the Soviet style of fighting. So it's it just. The ignorance and the arrogance and the utter contempt for these people's lives, you know, and just reverted back. That's the problem. They reverted back to their old selves, man. Somebody showed them a picture of Lenin and back back they went. Well, speaking of which, here's one more display of contempt for Ukrainian lives. This is our friend Chuck Todd. 
Biden has succeeded in rallying NATO nations to help fight a proxy war between Ukraine and Russia without putting any American boots on the ground or any NATO boots on the ground. Do you see who, do you see the footage that he's showing? He's showing a footage of one of the Azov brigades. That is the second Azov brigade, <laughs> the, the newer of the of the neo-Nazi Azov brigades. And that's the footage he's using, which is perfect. So he's bragging about how we've gotten Ukraine to fight this proxy war for us and without costing any American lives. And then to illustrate how successful it is, they're showing members of a neo-Nazi militia, the Azov Baton. And that's a success. That's that's what success looks like. <laughs> now, Lev, I want to be you know uh, fair here, which is and point out that whenever I talk about the issue of the far right and Nazis inside Ukraine, people will say, "Well, what about Russia?" And they'll point to the presence of neo-Nazis inside Russia. Now, mm -hmm. one example of that is actually a Russian militia that was now fighting on Ukraine's side. They recently launched that cross-border raid into Russia. So they're they're anti-Russian government, but they're but people also say that there are Nazis who support Putin. And the example I often get is that apparently one of the founders of Wagner, this mm -hmm. uh, private mercenary army, that he is a Nazi, is that, and there's a photo often shown of what I'm told is him with a with a Nazi tattoo. Mm -hmm. Is that true? So is it true that the co-founder of Wagner, this Russian mercenary army, which worked for the Russian government until recently when Prigozhin launched that mutiny, but is it true that this guy was a Nazi? And to hear the rest of the interview, please go to usefulidiots.substack.com. That was great. Yes, thanks so much to Lev Galenkian for joining us. And you can always read his writing at The Nation, where he contributes frequently, and his memoir. Yes, A Backpack of Bear and Eight Crates of Vodka is great. Uh, I really enjoyed it. I actually listened to it on audiobook. Oh, very cool. Yeah, very cool. it's a great book, though, yeah. Usefulidiots.substack.com or usefulidiots.locals.com to subscribe and get bonus content. And we'll see you next time. Thanks so much for joining us. Make sure you do join so that you can see the full interview with Lev, which is really fascinating. And also so you have access to our Thursday Throwdown, your midweek dose of media madness. Hello, thank you so much for listening to and watching Useful Idiots. For full episodes and extended interviews, please subscribe at usefulidiots.substack.com. You can subscribe on YouTube at youtube.com slash usefulidiots for clips, live streams, and full episodes. Also subscribe to us wherever you find your podcast. Follow us on Twitter at usefulidiotpod and use the hashtag UsefulIdiotsPod. Join us Mondays at 10 a.m. for the Useful Idiots Monday Morning Show, where we discuss the Sunday morning news shows so you don't have to watch them. <laughs>